Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be going over chapter 3 in Zumdahl 7th edition. Uh, it's about stoichiometry. It does go through things pretty quickly though, so it assumes that you actually know a lot about stoichiometry from your previous chemistry class, but if you have any questions, let me know. Alright, so what is stoichiometry? So stoichiometry is the study of the quantities of materials that are consumed and produced in chemical reactions. Um, one of the hallmarks of chemistry is stoichiometry. And so what we're going to start with is counting by weighing, which is like a practical skill. So the first thing that we assume when we are doing something like this is that all of the objects behave as if they were identical, that they're all exactly the same, even though sometimes in reality that isn't necessarily the case. We also assume that atoms are much too small to be actually physically counted, and also that we need to average masses in order to get the mass of the objects that we're looking at because they're so small. So a good example of counting by weighing that you could actually do in reality is if I gave you a pile of marbles and I said this is how much these marbles weigh, um, 394.80 grams. If I were to give you 10 marbles, let's say that weighed 37.60 grams, how many marbles are there in this jar or in this pile or whatever it might be? So we can already tell what we need to do. I would need to look and see, okay, how can I figure out what the weight or mass of an average marble is? And then can I look at the total and make a logical deduction? So a good way of setting that up would be something like this. I know that the average mass of one marble would be 37.60 grams divided by 10, so I can just do 3.76 grams per marble. And then if I have my total here, which is 394.80, I can just divide by that and get 100 five marbles. Now notice that if this doesn't work out evenly, you can't have a fraction of a marble, just like you can't have a fraction of an atom. So you're always, if you're counting something like atoms, going to have to round to the nearest whole number as a means of figuring out, uh, again, you can't have like half of an atom or something. Okay, so let's look at atomic masses. This is section 3.2. So carbon-12 is our standard for finding atomic mass. And so carbon-12, that specific isotope of carbon, weighs exactly 12 atomic mass units. So we use the symbol U uh, for atomic mass units. And so notice, though, that right here, if you look at your nice little carbon on your periodic table, it says that it actually has an average atomic weight of 12.011, which is not 12 atomic mass units. So what we're going to talk about is how did we get from, you know, something like this, a standard, to 12.011. So what we need to know is that every single other element from the periodic table and every other atom, so even carbon, remember there's carbon 12, 13, 14, so this isotope specifically has exactly the atomic mass of 12. Um, every other element and every other atom is weighed in relative mass to the standard. So it's kind of like a starting point. Now, elements occur, though, as we just said, in a mixture of isotopes. So carbon-12 is not really found in nature in its pure form. Instead, it is a mixture of carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. So how exactly do we get this, and how are we able to use what we just learned in section 3.1 to fit with section 3.2? So let me give you the breakdown, okay? Carbon-12 makes up 98.89% of carbon that you find in nature. Carbon-13, 1.11%. And then right here, we have carbon-14, which makes up less than 0.01%. So just looking at these numbers, you can see that the average atomic mass is pretty close to 12, but it's a little bit more. And that little bit more is because of this stuff here, the carbon-13 and carbon-14 isotopes make up a percentage of that also. So the reason what the reason why we kind of average everything is exactly what we just looked at in section 3.1. We're finding the average atomic mass, not the exact atomic mass. So the way that we would write this would be, okay, I know that I have 98.89%, um, which is going to represent by um, 12 atomic mass units because that's our standard. And then I would weigh carbon-13. So carbon-13 weighs 13.0034 atomic mass units. Not exactly 13, but pretty close to 13. And that makes up 1.11%. So what I would do, and again, notice that this is our exact number, is I would just multiply them together and then add them together and to get my total. So right here, 
I've got my uh, first part here, which is my carbon-12 part. Here I've got my carbon-13 part. And if you're wondering, hey, why don't we include carbon-14? Carbon-14 made up such a small percentage that in reality I would need more significant figures if I were going to include it in the calculation. And in reality, it wouldn't actually make that much of a difference unless I had, you know, five or six sig figs that I was trying to get my average atomic mass of carbon to. So when you do that, you get 12.01 atomic mass units, which mass matches what was on that little tile. So here, here is again a good explanation and a good summary. Even though natural carbon does not contain a single atom with a mass of 12.01, we can, via again weighing things and using our averages for stoichiometric purposes, consider carbon to be composed of one type of atom with a mass of 12.01. Because think about it, if you get a sample of carbon, it's going to be made up of all of those isotopes, carbon 12, 13, and 14, but the relative percents are going to be 98%, you know, carbon uh, 12. So since that's the case, um, we can then use this average from the periodic table um, to do our, you know, mathematical things um, when we're trying to solve different types of chemical equations. So like it says, this enables us to count atoms of natural carbon simply by weighing carbon. All we need to do is weigh it in order to figure it out. So how did we figure out these relative masses, um, or sorry, relative abundances, I guess I should say? Uh, we use mass spectroscopy. So I'm not going to explain to you how mass spectroscopy works, but here's an example of um, zirconium isotopes. So if you were to give me a sample of zirconium and I were to put it into a mass spectrometer, this is what the readout might look like. So we can see that zirconium-90, the isotope um, that has a mass number 90, makes up more than half of the actual naturally occurring um, isotope um, of zirconium. And then zirconium-91 makes up this sliver, 92. There is no zirconium-93, 94. There's no zirconium-95. And then we have this little sliver that makes up zirconium-96. So if I were to estimate these sizes, I could then, you know, theoretically, figure out what is the average atomic mass of zirconium. I could just assume, you know, that, okay, zirconium-90 is going to weigh about 90, and then say, okay, so this is 50, that's 60, so let's say that's 52, I want to take a guess. I could do exactly what I did with carbon and just kind of add those up, and as I add up each one of these little slivers, that will tell me on average what a zirconium atom would weigh if I were to find it in nature. So I didn't know where to put this, but I'm just going to kind of insert that in this portion anyway. Um, if I were given some atom, it doesn't matter what it might be, and I were to um, allow it to absorb different types of radiation, uh, this is what would actually happen. So let's say I shoot some microwaves at a molecule or at an atom. Uh, what's going to happen as a result of that? So uh, the atom or molecule will rotate. Um, if I were to give myself some infrared energy, which has more energy than a microwave would, um, it would vibrate, um, which means, again, if I were to look at the bonds in our molecule, um, it, they would start to like uh, stretch and squash. Um, and then if I were to give it some ultraviolet light, it would therefore give me some sort of electronic transition to a higher energy level, which would then probably release some form of radiation as a result. So this doesn't really fit with section 3.2, but I needed to insert it somewhere. So this was the easiest way to kind of get that in there. Now let's do an exercise where we're actually calculating an average atomic mass. So an element consists of 62.60% of an isotope that has a mass of 186.956 atomic mass units. 37.40% has a mass of 184.953 atomic mass units. Let's calculate the average atomic mass. Can you? Try to set it up and I'll show you what it should look like. So it should look like this. So all I did was I turned my percents to decimals, multiplied these together, and then added my second isotope. You should get something that's pretty close to 186.2 atomic mass units. Notice that I am giving myself four significant figures because these percentages have four significant figures. Um, and then look it up on the periodic table. What has an atomic mass pretty close to that? That would be rhenium, R-E. All right, now let's talk about the mole. So the number equal to the number of carbon atoms in exactly 12 grams of pure carbon-12. Again, we're using carbon-12 as our standard here. 
it's going to be something that we call Avogadro's number. And so we like to define that as what we call a mole. A mole of something is going to consist of exactly 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd units of that substance. So Avogadro's number, which you've heard of before, is what we're talking about. And so this is our equivalence. One mole of carbon is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms, which is equal to the average atomic mass that we just calculated, which is 12.01 grams of carbon. So this gives us a practical unit. So we can't count atoms, but if I weigh this much on an electronic balance, I then can know that, okay, I have this many atoms in my little dish. And then because, you know, these numbers are so large, we like to define that as something that we call a mole so that we can do very easy calculations with those numbers. So for example, let's calculate the number of iron atoms there are in 4.48 moles of iron. So let's take a look at our periodic table and stuff and figure out what we would need to look at here. All right, so I've got iron. It doesn't matter what that average atomic mass is. You just need to know that Avogadro's number is always equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd iron atoms. So what I would do is I would take my 4.48, I would multiply by Avogadro's number. Notice that my uh, conversion factor here, I'm going to be getting rid of moles of iron. Those are going to cancel away. And I would get a number that looks like this, 2.70 times 10 to the 40, or sorry, times 10 to the 24th iron atoms, which makes sense, right? If one mole is 6.02, times 10 to the 23rd, then 4.48 moles of it would be 4.48 times as much. Now let's talk about molar mass, that's section 3.4. Molar mass can be found on the periodic table. So for example, this nitrogen, um, and by the way, this entry has more significant figures than your uh, periodic table does, but still it rounds, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so the molar mass of a single nitrogen would be exactly what it says here on the periodic table when you look up nitrogen, 14.01 grams per mole. Now, if you have a molecule, right, if we have H2O, uh, what would we do? Well, we would have to take a look at what the periodic table says for hydrogen. And so we have double because H2, the two is letting me know I have two hydrogens. So I would double this number and then oxygen, I only have one. So I would just add this to it. So this is what I would do. Two times 1.008 plus 16 would give me my 18.02 grams per mole. What if you see parentheses in something? What if we have barium nitrate here? Um, just remember that this little parentheses here and this two apply to everything within it. So I actually have two nitrogens and I have six oxygens. So given what I have here, I already have nitrogen and I already have oxygen. I just need to know what barium is and barium is a gigantic element. It's 137.32 or 33, I guess I should say, since I'm rounding. And this is what it would look like. I would take my barium. I have double this for my nitrogen. I have six times that much for my oxygen. I get 261.35 grams per mole. All right, concept check. Which one of these has the closest average mass to one atom of copper? Take your guess. Only one of those makes sense. It's going to be a tiny, tiny, tiny amount, right? Because I need to make sure that I'm using Avogadro's number. A lot of times people make the mistake and say, oh yeah, well, you know, copper uh, weighs uh, this from the periodic table. But no, we're not looking at how much it weighs, you know, like, you know, a mole of copper. We're looking at one atom of copper. So just keep in mind, this is what you would do. I would do one copper atom. I would have to divide by Avogadro's number to get to moles, and then I would have to multiply that by the uh, average atomic mass of copper. And so this is why a lot of people accidentally pick A, but no, the answer would be E. It's gonna be a tiny, 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 tiny amount. Calculate the number of copper atoms in 63.55 grams of a sample of copper. All right, see if you can do that. So this is what I would actually probably say. Oh, I don't even have to calculate anything. Remember that the average atomic mass is going to be equal to Avogadro's number. So if I look up on my periodic table and it says copper, you know, weighs this much to have one mole, then I have exactly one mole of copper. Which of the following 100 gram samples contains the greatest number of atoms? So magnesium, zinc, or silver, if I had 100 grams of each one of these, which one would have the greatest number of atoms? Take a guess. Answer, magnesium. 
think about it. Magnesium has the smallest average atomic mass here. So if I have 100 grams of it, I'm going to have more magnesium than I would zinc, than I would silver. Next one, rank the following according to the number of atoms, greatest to least. Now take a look. What do you think? There's a logical way of doing it, and then there's a not-so-logical way of doing it. I'll let you know, though, what they are first. So it should go zinc here, then it should go silver, and then we should go magnesium, greatest to least. Here's the reason why. Take a look at it. Silver is exactly what its atomic mass says, so it's exactly one mole. Zinc, on the other hand, okay, it's going to be a little bit more because I have 70 grams, whereas the average atomic mass is 65.39. Magnesium, on the other hand, is, you know, smaller, 21. And this has, you know, 24, so it's going to be under a mole. So even without doing any calculations, I would know that the answer should be zinc has more because it has more. Um, silver is exactly a mole, and then magnesium is going to be less. Consider separate 100 gram samples of each of the following. So I have 100 grams of water, I have 100 grams of dinitrogen monoxide, I have 100 grams of C3H6O2, and I have 100 grams of carbon dioxide. Rank them from greatest to least number of oxygen atoms. Think about that. Picture what it's asking you to do and then take a look at what you think the answer might be. All right, let's take a look. The answer order should be the following. H2O, CO2, C3H6O2, and 2O. Now you might think, why or how? Well, I'm gonna give you the calculations here, and then this is gonna come back in a little bit, so I don't wanna actually give away too much, but these are the amount of oxygen atoms in each sample here. But keep an, keep an eye on this, because it's going to come back in a second. So let's talk about conceptual problem solving. How exactly do we learn to solve problems in chemistry? The first thing you got to always ask yourself is, where are we going? Read the problem, decide on the final goal. I always say to underline whatever it's asking you to do, especially if it includes units. You want to make sure your unit always matches. Next, how do we get there? Work backwards. Think about where exactly do I need to go in order to get to where I want to go. You know, I want to get to my goal. Figure out what you need in order to get there. And then last but not least, once you've figured it all out, does your answer make sense? This is something that people never do. And you get the weirdest answers whenever you don't actually check and see if your answer makes any reasonable sense. You get the strangest answers. All right. So let's talk about the percent composition of a compound. So what is the mass percent of an element? The mass percent of an element is equal to the mass of the element of the compound divided by the mass of the compound times 100. Makes sense, right? We're just basically finding a fraction here. So this is like, let's say, element x. This is the mass of the entire compound, and I would multiply that by 100. So how much iron is there in iron 3 oxide? This is iron 3 oxide. All right, I can figure that out. Let's figure out what the masses would be. So I have two irons in iron 2 oxide, so I would take my nice little molar mass here, multiply it by 2, and then I would find what is the molar mass of iron 3 oxide. So the whole thing has two irons and has three oxygens. So when I work that out, I get this fraction. I need to make sure that I multiply it by my 100 in order to get to an actual percent here. So it's 69.94% iron. That's how you find the mass percent of something. All right, great. So now let's go back to that problem that I told you we were gonna like come back to. Now let's look and make sure here that we have our same 100 grams. Let's rank them from highest to lowest percent of oxygen by mass. See if you can do that. You have to find the molar mass of each one. Okay, we can do that. But look at the order. The exact same as before. Now think about what the previous question asked the number of oxygen atoms. Look at what this is asking you for, the percent of oxygen. Obviously, if you have more oxygen in your compound, you're going to have a higher percentage of oxygen by mass. So of course it's going to be the same order. We don't even have to solve that, really. But here's what I would then do. So if you found your percentages, water is 88.81% oxygen. Carbon dioxide is 72.71%. C3H6O2 is 43.20%, and then dinitrogen monoxide is 36.35%. So yeah, it matches exactly what we did 
in the previous problem. All right, let's talk about formulas. So empirical formulas are the simplest whole number ratio that a formula can have. So you can't simplify this anymore. I have a single carbon, I have a single hydrogen. Now, molecular formulas are your empirical formula that you multiply everything by an integer. So for example, this is benzene, C6H6. That is a real compound. It's the actual formula for it. CH doesn't actually exist, but it's useful for us to be able to figure out the empirical formula for various compounds. So let's figure out what this might look like and how I would do this. So I have a dipic acid, which is 49.3% carbon, 6.9% hydrogen, and 43.8% oxygen by mass. Here's the molar mass of it. What is the empirical formula? Here's what I would do to figure that out. So 43.3 grams of carbon. I would convert that to moles. This is how many moles it is. How did I do that? 49.3 divided by 12.01. Great. Let's find out how much hydrogen there is. 6.9. Great. How many moles is that? 6.845 moles. How did I do that? Division. Next, oxygen. 2.7375 moles of oxygen. How did I do that? Division. Okay, now that I have moles, I can compare them to each other. So what I want to find is what is the ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen? So how would I do that? Well, I would take the smallest one of these numbers, which is this one, 2.7375, and I would divide each and every one of these by that number. When I do that, what I get is I have 1.5 times the amount of carbon, 2.5 times the amount of hydrogen, and one, a one-to-one -one ratio of oxygen. Great. Remember, we can't have fractions of an atom, though. So how can I make these nice whole numbers instead? I could multiply them all by 2. If I multiply them all by 2, I get 3, 5, and 2. That means that my empirical formula is going to be, oh, I got cut off, but still, C3H5O2. It's going to have this ratio. Now, let's answer the second part to this question. Same exact question. What's the molecular formula? Because remember, the empirical formula is useful, but it literally just gives us the smallest whole number ratio. So now we're going to finally use the molar mass part, 146 grams per mole. So we found that this is our empirical formula. If I find the molar mass of this and I add everything up, I get that the molar mass of this molecule is 73.07 grams per mole. Now, the molar mass is supposed to be 146 grams per mole. So what can I do? Well, to get to, uh, to 146 from 73.07, Seven, I just multiply everything by 2, which means my molecular formula would be double uh, C6H10O4. And notice, pretty close, 146, 146.1. That's how you would determine the formula for any compound. All right, next, representation of chemical reactions. All right, so here's a chemical reaction. Um, I've got C2H5OH, three oxygen molecules, and I am now making two carbon dioxides, and I'm making three water molecules. So these are our reactants on the left side of the arrow. Products are on the right. Notice that we always have an arrow separating one side from the other so that we know which are the reactants and which are the products. Now, for the same thing again. The equation in this case is balanced. What do we mean when we say that the equation is balanced? We mean that all of the atoms that are present in the reactants are also accounted for in the products. In other words, if I were to count how many carbons I have, I have two carbons here. I have two carbons here. How many hydrogens do I have? I have five, six. I have six hydrogens here. I have six hydrogens here. Same with my oxygens. You can count your oxygens. Six, I have seven oxygens here on this side of the arrow. I have seven oxygens here on this side of the arrow. So what this is telling me is if I have a mole of ethanol and I react it with three moles of oxygen, I would produce two moles of carbon dioxide, and I would produce three moles of water. That's how you read these chemical equations. Now, a balanced equation represents an overall ratio of the reactants and products, but it's not actually what happens during the reaction. This is just saying this is how you would equally be able to react your reactants to get an equal amount of products on the opposite side. So the use of the coefficients is basically just you know, a way of figuring out the amount of reactants that are used and the amount of product that is being formed. That's what those coefficients are there for. So how do we write balanced equations? First thing you want to do, determine what reaction is occurring. What are your reactants? What are your products? Pro products, sorry. And what are your physical states, if any, that are involved? Next, write an unbalanced equation. 
So make sure your reactants are on this side. Make sure your products are on that side. Make sure your formulas you wrote are correct. Next, balance the equation by inspection. Start with the most complicated molecule and make sure that you are able to get the same amount of atom um, atoms on one side versus the other. Now, like it says, um, you might not be able to do that immediately, but you should be able to get there eventually. The way that you kind of balance something is you change something on one side, and the chances are you will now have to change something else on the other side, and you keep going back and forth. Now, like it says, you never, ever, ever change the formulas of the reactants or products. If you do that, you are going to be making a very grave mistake. And now, Here's our question. Which of the following correctly balances the chemical equation below? There may be more than one correct balanced equation. If the balanced equation is incorrect, explain what's wrong about it. So we have Roman numeral 1, 2, 3, and 4. Which one or which ones balance it correctly? And then which one is going to be, if any, like it says, uh, incorrect? All right, let's take a look. So that one definitely is going to be balanced, right? If you count your number of carbon atoms and uh, calcium atoms and oxygen atoms, everything balances completely. This one also is fine. We used fractions in this case. It's okay to use fractions in a balanced equation if necessary. And then, yeah, this one also works. Notice that it's just this one double. The only one that doesn't work is this one here because they changed the coefficients of stuff and you can't do that. We can't change the coefficients in something. You can't just add a 2 here and say, okay, and now I have CaO2. CaO2 doesn't exist. All right. So which of the following is true concerning a balanced chemical equation? There may be more than one true statement. What do you think? Number of molecules is conserved. The coefficients tell you how much of each substance you have. Atoms are neither created nor destroyed. The coefficients indicate the mass ratios of the substance used. The sum of the coefficients on the reactant side equal the sum of the coefficients on the product side. The only one that's correct there is going to be atoms are neither created nor destroyed. All the other ones, some of them might be true in certain situations, others not true just at all. So let's notice the number of atoms of each type of element must be the same on both sides of a balanced equation. Subscripts can't be changed. Also, balanced equations let us know the ratio of the number of molecules which react and are produced in a chemical reaction. Coefficients can be fractions, although we like to give them as the lowest integer. Um, you know, it's totally fine to use fractions just for mathematical purposes when you are using them in such a way. All right, now, calculating the masses of reactants and products in reactions, 3.10. Told you this was going to be a long one. So first thing you want to do, always balance your equation. So hopefully you get good at balancing equations because you're going to be asked to balance tons of equations. Next, convert the known mass of the reactant or product to moles of that substance. Next, use the balanced equation to set up the appropriate mole ratio, and then use the appropriate mole ratios to calculate the number of moles of your desired reactant or product, and then finally convert back to grams if required by the problem. So I know that sounds weird, but this is kind of what you do. You're going to be given a mass of a known substance. You're going to convert that to moles. You're going to find your mole ratio. The way you find it is by looking at your balanced chemical equation. Once you find that, you use your proper mole ratio, and now you've converted to moles of whatever substance you want, and then you're going to convert that to grams. So it looks complicated, but really, you balance your equation, you go through this process, find your mole ratio, plug it in, and then you get your answer, if required to convert to grams. Normally, you'll be required to. So here we go. Consider the following reaction. We've got P4 plus 5O2s, and that gives us 2 P2O5s. So it says, if we have 6.25 grams of phosphorus, what is the mass of oxygen that it would take to combine with it? So in other words, if I said, okay, I'm going to give you some phosphorus here way out this much, how much oxygen would I need to give you in order to make, again, my nice balanced equation actually balanced and work and, you know, to make this stuff here? All right, great. I can figure this out using the process that was just outlined. So Let's use this process and see if we can figure it out. First thing, what am I done? What have, what am I done? Uh, what have I been given? 6.25 grams. So I know this. I can convert that to moles. I can find the molar mass of P4. Next, I want to get two moles of this, O2. What is my mole ratio? My mole ratio is five oxygens to one P4, to one phosphorus here. 
Now that I've done that, I can find, great, how do I convert from moles of something to grams? I would then multiply by my molar mass of O2. Now, a lot of times people make the mistake and they say, okay, I'm going to multiply by the molar mass of five O2s. No, you don't do that. You already took care of the five by looking at this step here and doing your mole ratio. You don't want to double count and accidentally multiply things by something else. So this is what you would actually do. 6.25 grams divided by 123.88 grams. Multiply by 5, multiply by 32, and now we get our answer, which is going to get cut off, I guess. Uh, it looks like 8.07. So 8.07 grams of oxygen is what I would get if I plugged this into my calculator. Notice grams is going to cancel here of P4. Moles is going to cancel here of P4. Moles of O2 is going to cancel here. Oh, sorry, here. And I'm going to be left with an answer that's just in grams like I wanted. Your key to all of this is making sure that your units are always canceling when you go through this process. Next, methane, CH4, reacts with oxygen and air to produce carbon dioxide and water. Ammonium, that's NH3, reacts with oxygen and air to produce nitrogen monoxide and water. Write balanced equations for each of these. So, methane. Oxygen. Remember, oxygen is O2. Carbon dioxide, you should know that that is CO2. Water, you know, is H2O. Balance that. You should have gotten something like this. All it takes is a 2 here and a 2 there. Ammonia. This one's actually a little bit harder, but ammonia is NH3. Reacting with oxygen. Again, remember, oxygen is O2. Nitrogen monoxide, hopefully you know that's NO. And then water is H2O you get something like this. So I've got a 4 here, a 5, a 4, and a 6. That's how I would balance those. Now let's think about it. Where are we going? So I want to find the mass of ammonia that would, be, um, that would produce the same amount of water as 1 gram of methane reacting with excess oxygen. All right? How do I get there? Well, what do I need to know? How much water is produced? I would need to know that. I would need to know how much ammonia is needed to produce that amount of water. Again, you always want to go through, if you're solving some sort of problem, you want to go through the logical steps of asking, where are we going? How did we get there? Now, let's talk about limiting reactants. Limiting reactant. The reactant that runs out first and thus limits the amount of product that can be formed. Okay, This is our last section, thankfully. right? So limiting reactants are in most chemical reactions. You're going to run out of something first. You rarely, if ever, have the exact amount of something that you want. Now, to determine which reactant is limiting, what we need to do is figure out how many products or how much product is going to be forming. So for example, if I have a stoichiometric mixture, that means I have N2 plus 3H2 gives me two NH3s. I got this. This would be if everything worked out perfectly. Look, so if I count, I have, you know, every... Every uh, nitrogen here that's in blue has three uh, white hydrogen uh, molecules next to it in order to perfectly make my NH3s. Uh, this would be a stoichiometric mixture where everything is used up, everything's perfect. But in reality, this is normally what happens where you have a limiting reactant. So if I were to like circle again, which ones are working out perfectly, I would run out of hydrogens. I have too much nitrogen. And that means I ran out of hydrogens then, because hydrogens were one of my reactants here. So in this case, hydrogen would be my limiting reactant. And then nitrogen would be an excess, meaning I have too much of it. I didn't need these molecules. If I were to remove these two molecules, I would then have a stoichiometric mixture. So here's, again, our idea here. Our limiting reactant, like I said, was hydrogen because I ran out of it. And then what's in excess is my nitrogen because, again, I have too much of it. So here's a question, which of the following reaction mixtures would produce the greatest amount of product? Each reaction involves the following. I have two hydrogens plus one oxygen gives me two H2Os. So what if I had two moles of hydrogen and two moles of oxygen? Or two moles of hydrogen and three moles? Or two moles of hydrogen and one mole? Or three moles of hydrogen and one mole of oxygen? Or would they each produce the same amount? Think about it they would all produce the same amount. I know that sounds weird, but again, work it out. Which one would be, in your each case here, our limiting reactant, and then how much product would we be able to form as a result of that? Just think about it, right? In each one of these cases, I have hydrogen here, and I'm running out of oxygen. 
so I don't have enough oxygen to be able to make anything else, I would actually make the same amount each and every time. So notice, we cannot simply add the total number of moles of reactants to, this, uh, to decide which reactant mixture will make the most product. So in the previous example there, you saw different situations with different amounts, but yet we still made the same amount. That seems a little weird. So we always have to think about how much product we will be able to form, and we use, like it says, what we're given and our ratio to figure that out. So here is a concept check. You know that we have chemical A that's reacting with chemical B, we react 10 grams of A with 10 grams of B. Great. Which one am I going to run out of is the question here. How much product am I going to make? Now, before we do that, I want you to think, hey, what would I need to be able to actually have? Like, what additional information would I need in order to do this? What do you think you would need? And I'll tell you right now. So, to determine this, right, I need to know what's my mole ratio between A and B. Is it a one-to-one? -one? Is it a one to two, two to three? What is it? Next, I would need to know my balanced equation, right? That's kind of what the mole ratio gives me. I also need to know how much do these things weigh? How much does A weigh? How much does B weigh? How much does C weigh? You know, whatever the product is, whatever we're making here, how, how much does that weigh? Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to answer this question at all. So let's give you some more information. I react 10 grams of A and 10 grams of B. What's the mass of product? Knowing the molar mass of A is 10 grams per mole. Molar mass of B, 20 grams per mole. Molar mass of C, 25 grams per mole. And they react according to the following equation. Oh yeah, let's figure this out, right? So again, great. A goes with this molar mass. B goes with this molar mass. I can use that. So by setting up a simple um, equation here, 10 grams of A, I can divide by the molar mass that I was given here, right here, 10 grams. And then I can use my balanced equation because I want to know how much product I'm going to make. So I'm going to say, okay, two moles for every one mole. I would make two moles of carbon here, or sorry, carbon of C. Next, let's do what B would be. All right, so I've got 10 grams, great, weighs more, so divide by 20. And the mole ratio is different for this one. It's a 2 to 3 ratio. So I would make 0.333 moles of C. Now, how you figure out which one of these is our limiting reactant and which one would actually work is you just look at whichever one of these is smallest. So in reality, if I, you know, again, if I'm just looking at this as an outsider, I would only be able to make this. Two moles is too much. I would, I'm limited here. So in reality, B is my limiting reactant. That's the thing I'm going to run out of. A is my excess reactant. It's the number that is bigger here. But now I have to figure out, great, one more step. I need to get how much C is there, how much would I make there. So let's figure that out. You can't really see it, but I'm using now 0.33 moles of C. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, great, I have this number of moles of C. I'm going to multiply by my molar mass, which is 25, and that's going to give me 8.33 grams of C. So my answer would be I would make 8.33 grams of C. And I did that by looking at uh, the information that I was given in the problem, so looking at A and looking at B and figuring out that B is my limiting reactant. It's the one that's going to give me less. All right, so our last part here is about percent yield. So percent yield is an important indicator of the efficiency of a particular reaction that we're looking at, and the way that we calculate it is we look at the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield, and we multiply by 100. That gives us our percent yield of you know how good, basically, we were at doing our reaction. So theoretically, the closer you are to 100% yield, the closer you are to your efficiency. You're, you, know, you're, you used the exact amount of stuff that you were supposed to use in your reaction to get your maximum yield, your maximum result. Okay. Now, if you get over 100% yield, that means you made some sort of mistake. You made an error. Um, you may have miscalculated something. Uh, you may have accidentally done something, like uh, not dried out something enough, and it's wet. And so now there's water in it, which is adding weight to your yield here. On the other hand, if your yield is less than 100%, like really, really low, let's say it's like 20 or 30%, you probably made some gigantic mistake in your lab. Now, let's figure this out. So let's say I have phosphorus. I've got fluoride gas here and then I'm making um, phosphorus trifluoride. So this is my uh, balanced equation here. It's asking me what mass of P4 is needed to produce 85 grams of P4 
P5, PF3, sorry, uh, if the reaction has a 64.9% yield. All right, that's a lot harder than just plugging in your actual and your theoretical, and that's it. So let's think a little bit about what this means. So I have 64.9% yield, right? So I know that if I had 85.0 grams, um, then I would need to figure out, okay, great, what is my you know bottom part here of that fraction, okay? So by doing that, I would be able to figure out, so 85 divided by what times 100 would give me 64.9%. That would be 130.97 grams of PF3. Great. Okay, so I know I have my starting point. Now I got to go through and figure out, okay, what would be that mass of P4 that I would need, right? So all I got to do is think about all the stuff we've been doing and plug it in and see if it works. So 130.97 grams of PF3, perfect. I can find the molar mass of PF3. I can divide by that. I can look at my mole ratio here. I'm looking at how much of this I would need, and then I have four of these. So I have one to four ratio between what I want and what I was given. Then I can find my molar mass of P4, that's 123.88 grams, and then that will give me my answer. Okay, so again, take a look at this. Make sure that this makes sense to you. Notice my grams of PF3 are going to disappear. My moles of PF3 are going to disappear. My moles of P4 are going to disappear, and I'm going to be left with grams of P4. So you always got to look at it and say, great, it gives me this. How do I get to this? And what is the answer end up being? 46.1 grams. And so that's how you would use our nice theoretical actual yield in a more complicated example than them just saying, hey, plug this in, plug this fraction in, multiply by 100 and get your percent yield. All right, that's the end. So if you have any questions, please let me know.